morning. Good morning, Kara. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 1, 1 through 6. It's the whole chapter, or the whole, yeah, chapter. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the sinful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Thank you, Kara. I can't tell this story without reading it, so here goes. But this is a true story and a good one. Sir Isaac Newton had a replica of our solar system made in miniature. In the center was the sun, of course, uh, with its retinue of planets re revolving around it. A scientist entered Newton's study one day and exclaimed, My, what an exquisite thing this is. Who made it? Nobody, replied Newton to the questioner, who was an unbeliever. You must think I'm a fool. Of course somebody made it. And he is a genius. Newton arose and laid a hand on his friend's shoulder and said, This thing is but a puny imitation of a much grander system whose laws you and I know, and I'm not able to convince you that this mere toy was, is without a designer and maker, and yet you profess to believe that the great original from which the design is taken has come into being without either designer or maker. Now tell me, by what sort of reasoning do you reach such an incongruous conclusion? So I thought that was good. I hope your Bible is open to Psalm chapter 1, and Psalm chapter 1 is all about life. In fact, specifically, how to live life to the full. Don't you want to live your life to the full? So that when you get to the end of your life, you'll have no regrets because you lived it to the full. And in fact, the dominant message, I think, of Psalm 1 is make the most of your life. Don't waste it. Don't uh, settle for less than a full, meaningful life. Don't settle for anything but uh, less than that. Only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So live your life to the full. So David is illustrating this in Psalm 1 by giving us um, two opposite approaches to life, very opposite approaches to life, uh, which are, in fact, an enormous contrast, as we're going to see. Uh, this psalm breaks down. The first three verses uh, talk about the godly, and then the second three verses, the ungodly. And you can see uh, the life that God blesses opposed to the life that man squanders. And so, first of all, in the first three verses, he talks about the life that God blesses. And uh, the person that God blesses, the Christian that God blesses, is separated from the world. That's the first thing. And by the way, these first three subtitles are not for me, but from Warren Wiersbe. The, I just hate his outlines because once you see his outlines, you can't come up with your own. It's just that way. It's, they're so good. So... Uh, separated from the world, and, and we're not talking about being isolated from the world. We're not talking about being isolated from non-Christians. Not that at all. Um, you know, how could we win souls if we isolate ourselves from the world, uh, from non-Christians? And uh, so, But it's that we are not contaminated by ungodly thinking and living, and that's what we mean by separated from the world. And so... Uh, um, Look what he says here in verse 1. He says, blessed, happy, blessed by God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. In other words, we don't uh, take the advice or we don't listen to what they're trying to push on us. The, the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners. Now, what I want to say here, I want you to know that um, our kids, we had our kids in public school a lot. So I'm not criticizing anybody who has kids in public school or that is involved in public school. We did. Um, um, we had our kids in Christian school, but we also had them in public school, especially through high school, because uh, we tried to start a Christian high school, and there's a lot to it, and we just couldn't get it done. But uh, what I want to do is not criticize anybody who has their kids in public school or is involved 
but to just kind of remind you to uh, what what you're looking again uh, looking at, because um, right now I've been saying that um, you know in the public schools, preschool through college, generally speaking, they are teaching the LGBTQ um, agenda, and it, it starts in preschool all the way through college. And if that wasn't true, then how come the governor of Florida passed a law, or he signed a law into effect, into law, saying that uh, it is not age appropriate to teach kids preschool through third grade about, the, um, about the, that uh, LGBTQ agenda. It's not something that is age appropriate. In fact, I would say it's not age appropriate for fourth, fifth, sixth grade, or, or all the way through high school. Uh, and uh, but this is something that we're facing, and uh, you know I know some of the people at the public school here. I know administrators and teachers and everything, and uh, they're people that I like and they're people that I I respect. But uh, I one of them gave an, a program at Rotary some time ago, and she said, you know, uh, it used to be kindergarten through you know K through twelve. And now, then she said, then it was preschool, then kindergarten, then uh, one through 12. And then uh, uh, Head Start, that got them a little earlier, but she said, we really want to get these kids at infancy. That's what she told us at Rotary. We want to have these kids from infancy. And I think the reason for that is because there are things that they want to uh, teach those kids. They want them to believe that we wouldn't exactly agree with. And it's not just in the public school, but it's in... Uh, um, Disney, you know that Disneyland will not greet uh, boys and girls now when they come to Disneyland because that's too sexist. They have to say, uh, welcome fellow adventurers. And of course, they're, going to, they're putting out uh, uh, movies that have LGBTQ heroes, you know, and, and of course, Hallmark is already putting out, you know, they always have had these kind of cheesy little uh, romance movies, you know, that... They're all the same, you know, somebody comes to town and they're very unhappy, but they meet somebody that they hate, ended up falling in love and getting married. Well, now it's going to be LGBTQ romances, and, and that's already started. They've got a special department in Hallmark movies for that. And, you know, it used to be if you wanted your kids to watch something that was really decent, you had them go to a Disney movie, right? And if you and your wife wanted to watch a movie that was really clean and decent, you watched a Hallmark Kind of a corny but uh, clean romance. But that's not the way it is anymore. They're pushing the LGBT, LGBT thing, and so it's going to be coming from all different areas. And so he says, blessed, happy, blessed by God is the man, woman, boy or girl, we could say, because man maybe is more uh, generic here. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. There are things that they want us to believe. There are the things that they want to convince us of. And we must not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. Now, what does it mean to stand in the path of sinners? I'm not too sure, but Jesus said there are two paths. He said there is the uh, narrow path that leads to life, which is a hard road. And then there's the, wa the broad path way which most people are on that leads to destruction that leads to hell and i think uh, even as christians maybe we can want to kind of compromise a little bit and maybe put one one foot on the wide path and keep the other foot on the narrow path but he says blessed is man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of the sinners if you're standing in the path of the sinners you're putting in your yourself in a place where you can be led astray. So, blessed is a man, woman, boy, or girl who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And I would say that, uh, you know, um, people on the left oftentimes are very scornful. They're just scorn anybody that disagrees with them. And, uh, I've read books by atheists, and the reason I've read them, I don't recommend them to you, but I've taught Christian evidences, and I want to be able to say, I know what I'm talking about when I say this is what they teach, and this is what they believe. And so I've read books by evolutionists, 
And they're always, almost always filled with vitriol, just hatred toward Christianity and toward Christians, and uh, just very vitriolic. I've read Richard Dawkins, and uh, oh boy, can he ever be vitriolic toward Christianity. But I want to balance this out a little bit, and I know I told this once, but I'm going to tell it again. Uh, I was driving from, our, from the parsonage to uh, my office, and I was listening to National Public Radio. You might say, what are you listening to NPR for? You know, that's liberal. Well, again, I want to know what they're saying. So I really am telling the truth when I quote them. At any rate, uh, Richard Dawkins was being interviewed. And he said that he had gone to Africa and some other places where he saw people that were really suffering. Just some terrible, terrible areas where they had dirty water, which made them sick. They, uh, you know, uh, they could, there was places where they didn't have enough food to eat and uh, terrible, terrible diseases. And uh, he said that uh, he thought, you know, we atheists ought to do something about that. We should uh, form an organization and uh, bring in some money so that we can alleviate some of that suffering. So he wrote letters to all of his influential atheist friends. And he said, look, we've got to form an, a, a, an organization to alleviate some of this suffering. And he said that he got not one single reply from any of those atheists. None of them was interested in alleviating the, the suffering of those people. But Richard Dawkins says, I saw Christians everywhere in those places. They had built orphanages. There were doctors and nurses that were there and they were providing medicine and they were uh, providing surgeries free of charge to these people. Uh, people were giving them animals to raise so that they could have their own industries and, you know, build up flocks and so on. And he said, Christians were everywhere. And I thought, you know, that's an interesting thing for him to say because uh, you, every once in a while an atheist comes to faith in Christ. And maybe that'll happen with Richard Dawkins too. But we should not be in the seat of the scornful. Look what he says, blessed, happy. Blessed by God is the man, woman, boy, or girl who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And so hopefully we're not sitting in the seat of the scornful. We don't want to be scornful of people uh, when it comes to those people we disagree with and the, that are not saved. We love them. We want them to come to faith in Christ. We want them to... Uh, to uh, believe what the Bible says. And so the, the life that God blesses, the person that God blesses is first of all, separated from the world. Okay, not, you know, not isolated from the world, but separated from the world in that we're not contaminated by their ungodly thinking and living. That's the whole idea. So separated from the world and then saturated with the word. Look at verse 2. This is just so great. And by the way, this just six verses, a wonderful passage to memorize. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, verse 2. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And so he's in the word of the Lord. He's in, he's in, uh, he meditates on the word of God. He says his delight is in the law of the Lord. By the way, does the Bible delight you when you hear it preached? Does it delight you when you uh, are reading it and, and meditating on it and memorizing it? It, it? Isn't there something that it does to you as you're reading through the Bible? It just delights you. It puts joy in your heart. It's a cleansing effect. And, and, and it puts a smile on your face. And so his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Now, I had a problem with that this week because I thought, why does he keep saying the law in that verse? Why does he say the law of the Lord? And so I uh, checked out a couple of commentaries, and I think, um, well, one of them, I think, had the key. And that is, when David wrote this psalm, how much scripture was written? How much scripture was available to him? We know that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were written, and Joshua and Judges, but that's it. By that time, by the time David was writing the Psalms, he was writing the next book of the Bible, but there were only like about seven books of the Bible that were written so far. 
1 and 2 Samuel weren't written because that's about David. And 1 and 2 Kings were not written because those are about David too, among others. And so there was only about seven books of the Bible that were written when he wrote this. And the first five books of the Bible are called the Law of Moses. They're called the Law of Moses. And so that's why he says the law. We could actually, I'm not telling you that you should retranslate this, but in our minds thinking, you can think of it this way. But his delight is in the word of the Lord, and in his word he meditates day and night. So we need to be saturated with the word. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you need to hear the word. Be in church on Sunday morning to hear it preached and, and taught in class. So you need to hear the word, and then you need to read the word. And I would recommend that you read a chapter of the New Testament and a chapter of the Old Testament every day. Whether you read in the morning or in the evening, whenever you do, you have your devotions, I would recommend you read a chapter in the Old Testament, a chapter in the New Testament every day, and that will be uh, helping you to be saturated with the Word. Then study the Word. There are people in this congregation that, stu that study the Word of God deeper than I do, that's for sure. Uh, they go into very deep Bible study, and uh, right here in this congregation, whether you go deep or not, study the Word of God, and then fourth, memorize the Word of God. And I would recommend you memorize at least the first three verses of this psalm, because uh, this is a psalm that will enrich your soul, that's for sure. So uh, memorize the Word of God, and it's not easy to memorize. I'm re-memorizing Psalm 1, and I'm still struggling with it all, at, even, so I've, even though I've memorized it a couple of times already. But memorize the Word, and I would recommend just the first half, the first three verses of Psalm 1. And then when you memorize the Word of God, that enables you to meditate on the Word. That is, you let it go through your mind over and over, and you think about it from this angle and from that angle. And uh, maybe you go through your commentaries, your, your study Bible, whatever. But you keep thinking new things about, this, uh, about the Word, meditating on it, just... Uh, ruminating on the Word of God. So you need to hear the Word, you need to read the Word, you need to study the Word, you need to memorize the Word, you need to meditate on the Word, and you need to live the Word. You put it into practice in your daily life. And so you need to memorize, you need to meditate on the Word of God and live the Word of God. And then you need to declare the Word of God. These seven things, hear it, read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it, live it, and declare it. That would mean witnessing to someone who doesn't know the Lord. Help them to understand how to be saved, what it means to, uh, to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then uh, maybe encouraging somebody with the Word of God. You see somebody that's down, you give them an encouraging word, and maybe something out of the Bible that will lift their spirits. Or you might be teaching. We got, I think, wonderful uh, Sunday school teachers in in uh, Mingo Bible Church. And those people that are teaching, that means that they really got to do a lot of research and then they got to bring it before you. And I think that's another way of learning the Word of God. And sometimes you declare the Word as a word of warning. Sometimes a word of warning to someone that's just kind of starting to stray off the path can bring them right back on track and uh, they'll be stronger than they were before. So you need to hear it, you need to read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it, live it, and declare it. And so the life that God blesses is the person who is separated from the world, not isolated, but separated, who is saturated with the word and then situated by the water. Again, these are Warren Wiersbe's, but look at verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, who, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Wow. He shall be, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall also not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So he's situated by the, you know, by the river. You've, you've seen this. As you're traveling cross-country, you'll see a river, 
And you'll notice a lot of times that there will be trees on each side, on each bank. And so you can see where the river is going because you see the two rows of trees. And so this gives you a good picture of where the river is. And why do the trees grow so well by the river? Because they've got a wonderful water source there. And the roots go right down to that source and they take in all the water that they need. And that's, he says, that's the way it is. If you are in the word like this, if you're separated from the world and saturated with the word and situated by the water, you're going to be flourishing. You will be flourishing. Now, um, it's interesting to me that Jesus talked about this a lot. Listen to what Jesus said in John 4:14. 4, you don't need to turn to it, but listen to what he says. He was talking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And then in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, Jesus said, here's what it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And isn't that true? I remember the day I was saved. I just knew something had changed in my life. And I know that uh, as I've lived, uh, you know, walked with the Lord all these years, he's given me joy in my heart. And, and, and life, it's like rivers of water. Now, Jeremiah also bothered, he borrowed from Psalm 1 as well, because listen to what he said. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out his roots by the river and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from bearing fruit. And so that's what he says. The life that God blesses is a life that's separated from the world and saturated with the word and situated by the water. It's situated by the water. Now, here comes the big contrast. This is a gigantic contrast right here because verses 4 through 6 talk about the life that man squanders. The first three verses, the life God blesses, but this is the life man squanders. What a tragedy when a person squanders his or her life. But people do it all the time. You know people that are squandering their life, just throwing it away, not living for things of, uh, of eternity, but living for the pleasures of this life. And so here's what happens to the life that man squanders in verses 4 through 6. First of all, He's scattered by the wind. Now, these are mine this time. Took a dictionary and looked up all the S's and all the W's here and uh, tried to keep it like Wearsby a little bit. But first of all, he's scattered by the wind. Look at verse 4. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Now, I think David is thinking about a farmer. Now, you guys, a lot of you are farmers, so you know what this is all about. They would go in and they harvest their crop, and they would take, I believe, the, whether it was wheat or barley, they would take the whole head, and they cut them off and put them in a cart until they got the cart all full. They'd take it to the threshing floor and empty the cart onto the threshing floor with the heads and everything, along with the berries. And so they'd take a, like a pitchfork, and they'd stick it under the pile, and they'd throw it up in the air, and the wind would blow the chaff away, but the berries are heavy, and they'd come straight down. And they would do that. They would keep doing that until all that was left was just the berries and all the chaff had been blown away. And that's the picture in verse 4. He says, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. They're like the chaff. And so uh, this is, their life is like scattered by the wind. And then I believe verse 5, look what it says. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They're shamed by their wickedness. And where is that shame going to come? When they stand before a holy God in judgment. 
Many years ago, a pastor told me that he had talked to a teenage boy about Christ. He was trying to win him to the Lord. He was explaining the gospel to him. And, he, and this teenager, was, um, he was resisting the gospel. And so this pastor said to him, well, if you're standing before God, when you someday stand before God, and he says, what, you know, why should I let you into my heaven? What will you say? And that boy said, I won't say anything. I'm going to be standing there with a 30 out 6 I'll be out there with a 30 out 6 rifle in my hand standing before God. Well, what can somebody do with a 30 out 6 rifle against God? God's going to be afraid of a 30 out 6 rifle. Besides the fact he's not going to have that at the judgment seat, he's going to have his hands empty. Um, but you see, that was the attitude. He was just going to stand there with a 30 out 6 rifle. But the, th the point is, this boy, if he's never accepted Christ and uh, has gone into the presence of God, he's not going to be standing there that way. He's going to be on his face, realizing that he's thrown his life away. Now he's entered into eternity, and it's too late. It's too late for him, because at that point, he cannot turn to the Lord. He can't say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, please save my soul now, because that's something that has to happen before we die. But you see, they're shamed by their wickedness, and this has to do with the judgment in verse 5, but I think it uh, also has to do with uh, the church, too. Notice it says in verse 5, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And I think maybe that's saying that uh, sinners sometimes are uncomfortable before the, uh, in, in a Bible-believing church. Uh, you remember I've told many times how I finally left the church I was raised in because it just was too boring. Uh, it was, uh, it, it, they, they just didn't teach it. I never heard the gospel the whole time I was there. I didn't know there was a gospel. Honestly, didn't know there was a gospel. And so I started going to a Bible-believing church, which was just across the alley from the church I r grew up in. And of course, the first time I went there, I sat close to the back so that I could make a getaway at the end. You know, I didn't want them to get their claws into me, you know, and uh, start telling me how I'm going to live my life. So I was sitting toward the back so that I could make a quick escape as soon as church was over. Because sinners are not always very comfortable in a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. So, um, and this, I've seen this happen before, too. My pastor that led me to Christ told us about uh, a man, he was our uh, janitor in, in uh, school. I can't remember if it was grade school or high school, but I think it was in grade school. And he started visiting the church, and he thought the pastor knew him and was preaching against him and, and you know, preaching about his sins. So then uh, he started uh, hiding behind the door. He'd come to church late, and he'd hide, hide behind the door, and the pastor was still preaching about his sins. And so he'd start coming every other Sunday. And somehow the pastor knew when he was going to be there because he preached about this guy's sins that, because God was convicting him. pastor had no idea. He, he didn't even know what this guy's sins were. But eventually he led this man to Christ. And uh, he became a very godly man, but he told the pastor about that after he got saved. And so that's, I think, what it means in verse 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. I think they'll be on their face, and maybe we will too on, when we meet the Lord in judgment. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They just don't feel comfortable in a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. And so they're scattered by the wind. They're shamed by their wickedness. And then... They're surpassed by the wise in verse 6. Look what he says. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so at the judgment, what does he say? The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. If they don't come to faith in Christ, if they're not born again, if they don't get saved, then um, they will perish. Now, Lest we get too proud, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. You don't need to turn to it, but listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, Paul writes to the Corinthians. Such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So, you see, uh, we, don't, we ought not to get self-righteous. We better not get too proud when we think about the lost because we were there at one time. Even if we were saved as children, we, there was a time when we were lost and uh, needed to come humbly and be saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I just want to end this message on this psalm with this final closing exhortation. Go to your Bible regularly. Go to your Bible regularly. Open it prayerfully. Ask God to, you know, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your word. That's part of Scripture. Open my eyes that you, that you, I may behold wondrous things from your word. So read it, um, open, go to your Bible regularly, open it prayerfully, read it expectantly, expecting a blessing, expe accepting, expecting an exhortation, and live it joyfully. You know, we're, we're not to live in a legalistic way, but we're free in Christ, and we are to live it joyfully. Go to your Bible regularly, open it prayerfully, read it expectantly, and live it joyfully joyfully. So I'd like you to uh, just bow your heads for a moment again this morning and, and be prayerful, be thinking. And I just want to ask again, if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you can't remember a time when you came before the Lord and you said, Lord, please, I know I'm a sinner. If I died today, I know I'd be in hell. But I know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on that cross for me, paying for my sins with his blood, paying for my sins in full. I know that he died a terrible death on that cross, but that he rose bodily from the grave, triumphant over sin and hell and death. Lord Jesus, you've made the way. Please forgive my sins. Come into my life and make me into a new person. I want to be born again. I want to be a child of God, born into your family by faith in you. You know, you can't work your way. You can't earn your way. You can't buy your way into heaven. There's only one way that you can enter into heaven or be saved so that you can enter into heaven someday, and that is to receive it as a free gift, bought and paid for already with the blood of Christ. And so you say, Lord, I receive that free gift that you purchased with your blood the gift of salvation, the forgiveness of all my sins, and the promise of eternal life, that when I die, that I'll be in heaven with you. Would you just tell the Lord that? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to be saved. Please forgive my sins. Come into my life and save my soul. And he will. There's nothing you can do except to receive it as a free gift. And he will come in. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He doesn't say might be, but he says shall be. And if you trust him, the Bible promises that he will save your soul right here and now. And then you begin that wonderful walk. It's not always easy. It can be very difficult. But it's that walk with the Savior, walk with the Lord in this life. And instead of squandering your life, you'll be living a life that God blesses as you read his word and as you walk filled with his spirit, as you walk um, in fellowship with the Lord, growing as a Christian day by day, he'll bless your life. You'll have troubles, yes, but even in the midst of the troubles, he'll be there to encourage and to bless you. If you've, if you've done that this morning, if you've told somebody, I mean, if you've asked God to save your soul, tell somebody, please. Just say, you know, I, I accepted Jesus as my Savior today. I trusted him to save my soul. And that'll just make their day. They'll be so pleased. So, Lord, we just thank you that being a child of God doesn't mean being brought into some legalistic, unhappy, um, dreadful existence. But rather, we become your children. 
you become our Heavenly Father. You are living in us. We've been made new. We're now more alive in you than we've ever been alive ever before. We thank you, Lord, that even when we have troubles and tragedies, which we will, you walk with us through those. We have you to be with us. But we also thank you that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control, that it's a, it's a joyful walk. Even in the tragedies, there's a certain kind of joy we can have, even in the, the trials of life. Thank you, Lord. Help us to walk as these first three verses of Psalm 1 describe, I pray, and help us to help those come to Christ who are walking according to the last three verses, I pray. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. And now, uh